Well, good morning. It's good to be here this morning and to uh, stand before you and open the, the word of life, the word of truth, the word of Christ. Um, also, we call them the scriptures. And so we're still continuing with a series of messages that uh, kind of actually began when... Uh, at least in part, when Mark talked about a month ago on uh, songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, or uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And the Bible instructs us to speak to ourselves through, the, through that method because that ingrains the truth of God. It's not just that we sing any random secular song, but when they're, they're psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, we are ingraining the truth of God's Word into us in a musical way, which we are inclined to, to remember. And it, it's powerful, and it's something that draws us and sticks to us, uh, within us, better than just reading sometimes. Although reading is important. But anyway, the, the message there was, was de directly connected to the truth of God's Word, taking the truth of God's Word and implanting it on the soul. And God recognizes a powerful way to do that is through singing. And so then, I think it might have been the very next uh, the lesson, I talked about how to hear God speak. And, and we kind of dealt with the issue that, you know, there's so many people today guessing at how God speaks to them. And they're looking at circumstances, or they just uh, think thoughts, and they think that that's God speaking to them. And sometimes they're led astray because what they, the conclusions they come up with are not in agreement with the Word, especially the rightly divided Word of truth. And so, I'm not saying every time, but many times, people are wrong when they claim that God told them something or God spoke to them, many times they're just they're using their imagination. And I know they're wrong because it's not in agreement with the rightly divided word of truth. And so that's an error that we want to be aware of. <clears throat> and so I, I walked us through a whole list of scriptures last time that talked about how God speaks through the scriptures. He has given us the Word of God. And the Scriptures even tell us that the Scriptures speak. Remember, we looked at a number of passages where it says, The Scripture saith. That's present tense. When you and I read that, that's still present tense. Scripture saith. Paul used that. He says, What saith the Scripture? And then talked about Abraham. Well, well, he had Genesis. Paul had the book of Genesis to go back on. But that was written hundreds, over a thousand years before Paul. And yet Paul says that Genesis, Genesis speaketh. He says that in Romans chapter 4. What saith the Scripture? And so there's a whole number of passages where, where it, the Scriptures say things. It tells us it says things. Present tense. So God is speaking through the Scriptures. So that was, that was the other message. And then Mark followed that up with how the Holy Ghost works, how the Holy Spirit works. And the Holy Spirit works in conjunction with the written Word. And, and the Holy Spirit um, is directly connected to the written Word. Now, we're going we're gonna to bring some more things out today that will further show that, is more evidence of that, that you can't separate the Word from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that, um, <clears throat> and I think we kind of dealt with this, that the Holy Spirit only works when you're reading the Bible. That's not what it means. But based on the truth that you get from the Scriptures, that's how the Holy Spirit's going to work in your life. If you know little of the Scriptures, you are diminishing the amount of input and work and influence the Holy Ghost can exert on you. But the more you're familiar with the Word of God, 
the more you immerse yourself in it, the more you open yourself up for the Holy Spirit to use that every moment, every day of your life. And so it's uh, all believers have equal access to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. It is the down payment, it is the security of our purchased possession, our redemption. The Holy Spirit is that security. But we can diminish, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, we can quench the Holy Spirit. And Mark talked about all that. And one of the ways that we do that is by neglecting the Word of God. <clears throat> and so now today, I'm going to circle back a little bit and, and get back to the Scriptures again and the fact that they are God-breathed. And so I invite you to turn to um, 2 Timothy. Um, Actually, I don't have it on there. Well, I invite you to turn there. And you can, you can stay here because we're going to finish up this message here in this passage. 2 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 15 and seven, through 17. And I kind of touched on these uh, a few weeks ago when we gave uh, this lesson on hearing God speak. And we're going to use this passage as a basis and then maybe come back to it towards the end of the message. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Throughly furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> now, I would contend that our attitude towards the Scripture is a big deal. Our attitude towards the Scripture matters. And, and, and one of the reasons, I mean, there are several reasons we can identify why that's a big deal. But one of the reasons I want to emphasize it now is because we live in an era of Christianity where the Scriptures are being diminished. You go back a hundred years, and they were not a, under attack like they are now. You go back two hundred years, in America at least, they were not under attack like they are now. You go back even four hundred years. You go back any time since the Reformation. In, in Western Civilization, the scriptures have not been uh, diminished and attacked like they are today in Europe and the United States. For the past perhaps 500 years since the Reformation, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church tried to diminish and squelch the scriptures from the common people. The Reformation brought a renewed interest, a renewed emphasis on the written Word of God in Western civilization. And it has, it has held strong since that time until the, the past 100 years there has been a decline, both in Europe and the United States. <clears throat> and here today, and I'm talking within, Christian, within Christianity at large. I'm not talking about the unbelieving masses of Muslims or uh, Buddhists or anybody else. I'm talking about within Christianity, the Scriptures are being diminished. In fact, today, I think we can easily recognize that most people, and I, I maybe I'm going out on a limb, but I would assume a majority that go to church in the United States today do so based on a personal experience, their feelings, and their emotions. Not based on a sincere desire for the truth. They go to churches that make them feel a certain way. They want to hear speakers that give them an emotional tingle. Or they go to some place because of the music. 
that brings a certain excitement to them. Maybe even a peace or a joy. But they, at the same time that there's an increase and a, and a, and a, a gravitational pull towards those things, there is an increase in laying aside the Word of God. Less emphasis on it. Less time spent from the pulpit preaching on it. And less, uh, less depth as it is being taught. And from the pulpit, and I lay this squarely at the feet of preachers, for the past hundred years there has been an increasing questioning of the authority of God from the pulpit. Even questioning whether they actually have the Word of God. Now, all of this is dangerous. Now, first of all, we notice right from this passage that we read, one reason why the Scriptures are vitally important is because they're able to make one wise unto salvation. The Scriptures are able to make one wise unto salvation. That's a big deal, right? Our salvation is a big deal. Personally speaking, anyone who cares to be saved and to be made right with the Lord for all eternity, that's a big deal. Well, the Scriptures are instrumental in that. <clears throat> and what is fascinating is many pastors and preachers today, and consequently their audiences as well, but sometimes the audiences don't really know what they believe and think or whatever, but the preachers and pastors should. They're teaching. They have a responsibility to be uh, at least somewhat firm and resolute in, in the fundamentals of what they believe. And yet, many of them don't even know for certain if they have the Scriptures. And maybe you're, you're not understanding where I'm coming from on that. But here's the thing. There are, are many churches... You can search it out. You can look at their statements of faith, their creeds, whatever their, uh, the, their doctrinal beliefs, however they present that on a, on a website or in a book or whatever. You can look it up church after church after church. And not all of them, but many of them will have some sort of statement like this regarding the Scriptures. The Bible is inerrant, is the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God in the original manuscripts. There'll be some sort of variation of that. Sometimes that's, that's, that, that's actually an exact quote I got off of a church website. But you look at many of them and they'll say something almost identical regarding the Word of God. The Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God in the original manuscripts. Now, there's a number of problems with that statement. Uh, on the surface, we think, well, yeah, right. Uh, that would be true. But there are problems with that statement. And there's a lack of um, critical thinking from people that just go along with things like that without really thinking it through. So I want us to be able to, to think this through. Because we talked about even, even the error of how God speaks. You know, you, you get away from Scripture on how God speaks to individuals, you open yourselves up, you open up all kinds of doors for doctrines of devils. That's how, you, we talk about the different sects of Christianity, whether it's Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witness, um, Hutterites, uh, I, I don't even know all of them. They all started with supposedly a leader hearing God speak. And God telling them things, and they started, a whether it's a new denomination or whatever, based on them convinced that God was speaking to them. But they weren't basing it on the Scriptures. It was some visions they were having or some thoughts they were having. And, and, and those ones I just mentioned, all those groups, they are contradicting the Word of God rightly dividing. So it wasn't God speaking to them. Maybe it was demonic. 
Maybe it was just their imagination. I don't know. But it wasn't God because it's taken all those groups away from the truth. <clears throat> now, this, this statement, the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God in the original manuscripts. So what's the problem with that? Well, I'll point out three things. One is, the original manuscripts do not exist today. They haven't existed for, for hundreds, if not almost thousands of years. Some of them more than that. You know, you go clear back to Moses or the book of Job, the earliest book of the Bible. It's been thousands of years since the original manuscripts existed. So if it's only inerrant and inspired in the original, what kind of confidence can we have? We can hope for the best. We, well, well, God, I hope this is the Word of God. This is the attitude that people are more and more adopting. We don't know. This is just, we're just going to take the thoughts, the main thoughts and ideas from this book, and we're going, to, we're going to teach from it and continue this Christian religion. But we don't know for sure that's the authoritative Word of God. That's the attitude more and more teachers today are taking. The original manuscripts do not exist. Secondly, original manuscripts were never a part of the Bible. The Bible is a book. That's what, that's what Bible means. It's a book. Now think about that. You take any book on the shelf, any book off of those shelves, you books you own, they were never made up of original manuscripts. Right? So it's, you always have original manuscripts, and then based off of that, you make copies. You copy that and you make a book. You make a book from the original manuscripts. An author sits down and he starts writing notes and scratching out uh, things and, and he, he grabs paper and, and, and he writes all this stuff down, but that's not the book. He makes a book off of that. Copies of that. The Bible is no different. So that's a contradictory statement to say that the Bible is inerrant, inspired Word of God in the original manuscripts. The Bible never was the original manuscripts. The Bible came forth from it. So if the Bible is inerrant, then the Bible you hold in your hand should be inerrant. Right? But if it's only the original manuscripts that are inspired then any Bible, the fir very first Bible would not be uh, inerrant if only the original were inerrant because the Bible was made from, by copy. And so the, the, even the statement itself is contradictory. Now, so, so that would mean the Bible that you hold is not inerrant because it's not the original. The very first Bible would not have been the original. Especially when you consider the fact that, that Genesis, the, the, the five books of Moses, were written way before the last book of the Bible, which maybe was Second Peter. There's a huge time span between that. So the originals were never in a book. <clears throat> so, if... if Based on that statement, the Bible is the inerrant word of God in the original manuscripts. Well, that's why we make, people, to make sense of that, they resort to studying Greek and Hebrew. Because it's not trustworthy in the English language. It's not trustworthy in German. It's not trustworthy in French. It's not trustworthy in Portuguese. We've got to go back to Greek and Hebrew. Because that's where it's the, the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God exists. But you see how this doesn't make sense. Logically, we can't follow through on that and have confidence going down that road. And the Scriptures have something to say about this. <clears throat> In fact, we're going to come back to this passage here in First Timothy or Second Timothy. You don't have to turn from it because I, we've got a lot of scriptures to look at, and so I put them on the screen up here. And so for the most part, we can read them off of there. Um, 
But did you notice that when we read that, I think I emphasized it uh, <clears throat> a couple weeks ago when we were here, that this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It doesn't say it was given. Another thing, it doesn't say that inspired men wrote it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is given to you in your English language by inspiration of God. All Scripture is given to me by inspiration of God. And if you're a Spanish-speaking person, all Scripture is given in Spanish by the inspiration of God. Now there's something that we should... So this should change our attitude towards Scripture. The, the modern scholar today, the biblical scholar today, is one of doubt, questioning. Can we trust this translation? Can we, can we get close to the originals with this? Or that, that, that's a bad reading, that's a bad rendering right there, let me correct the Bible. This is what the Hebrew really means. And they teach that way, always sowing doubt in the Word of God. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude toward the Word of God. So I'll ask a question. That Bible in your hands or on your, your device, is that Scripture? Is that the Scripture? It says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is what you're holding... Is that scripture? Well, let's look at a few uh, few verses. First of all, we notice in this this verse here, Second Timothy three fifteen, Timothy had a, he he had the scriptures from a young child, right? Now, when Timothy was a young child, none of what we call the New Testament had been written. The scriptures he had had been written long ago. It was the Old Testament. But the Bible tells us, the Scriptures tell us, that Timothy had the Scriptures. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. The Bereans had the Scriptures. Now, at that time, it would have been the Old Testament. This is the middle of the book of Acts. The, the, there might have been a few things written by this time, as far as the New Testament books, but, but not, not a lot. Paul hadn't written very much by this time, but they searched the Scriptures. They had the Scriptures. <clears throat> now another passage. This is where Philip is sent to the Ethiopian eunuch who is just coming away from Jerusalem having not received his, his spiritual questions at Jerusalem and on his way to depart from there and go back to Ethiopia, Philip is sent by the Spirit to minister to this man. And so he does. And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And now it tells us in, in Acts chapter 8 that the Scripture was in Isaiah where the Ethiopian was having questions. It was in Isaiah 53. That was the Scripture. But no doubt, it was if it was an Ethiopian... He wasn't reading it in Hebrew, the original language. It was probably Greek, which would have been most common at that time. So he was reading a translation, but it tells us he had the Scriptures. <clears throat> John chapter 5, verse 39. <clears throat> 
Jesus is talking here. He's, he's got these doubters coming after him, the Pharisees and, and the lawyers and the scribes, and they were the scholarly, educated Bible scholars of the day, no different than the ones of our day, largely. Questioning the authority of the Word of God. And Jesus comes along and He says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of Me. They had the Scriptures. If Jesus commanded them to search the Scriptures, they had the Scriptures. Even if they weren't speaking Hebrew, they had the Scriptures. <clears throat> Well, what does inspiration mean? Let's think about this for a little bit. We, we read there in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? What's inspiration mean? God breathed. Inspiration means breathe. So to, to inspire, or you see how it's, it's close to like respiration. Inspiration, respiration, there is a connection in the root meaning to breathe. And so the Scriptures are God breathed. Now, let's, let's think about this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. This is the first time where we're confronted with the idea of God breathing. God breathed the breath of life. And man became... Adam was there. He was formed. He had a body. But he was dead. He was not alive. There was no power. But God breathed into His nostrils the breath of life and the result was Adam became a living soul. There was life in the breath of God. And the breath of God equaled a living soul. Now, let's look at a couple passages in Job. <clears throat> Job 32 verse 8. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Now, I want to make the, see the connection here. The inspiration of the Almighty results in understanding. Now, Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God hath made me. The breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Now we can see a connection here between the inspiration of the Almighty and the breath of the Almighty and the understanding and the life. The, the, the inspiration of the Almighty giveth understanding. The breath of the Almighty giveth life. Now, as we think about that, you and I are given spiritual life by understanding and believing the gospel. And that's how we're given life. You're not given life apart from your understanding of the gospel. It comes from the breath of God. It comes from the, the, um, the life comes from the God breathe scriptures and your understanding and trust in it. Now, we could even go a little bit deeper with this inspiration. If you look it up in any good dictionary, you will find one of the definitions means to inhale. What's well, a that's a little different than because we think about God breathing. God breathed into Adam the breath of life. But what was Adam's response? Inhale. Adam took it in. He received the breath of life. I'm not saying Adam even made a choice in it. But he did because of God's pushing the breath in him. 
Adam received that breath. He inhaled, even without necessarily trying to. But you and I do have a choice. Adam maybe didn't have a choice in that particular situation. But spiritually, we are able to inhale the inspired Word of God. As God breathes it, we can pull it in. <clears throat> and that's spiritually uh, true. We inhale the breath of God. Now, there's a prophecy in Ezekiel we'll look at. And that's kind of small print because it's a large passage. And so if you can't read it from the back, you can just listen. I'll, I'll read through that. <clears throat> Ezekiel 37, uh, verse 3 through 9. And I want you to notice, I did underline it. Note, pay attention to the breath and the life and how the Spirit works as, as we're dealing with this passage. And, he, and he's talking about a future day when Israel will be revived. <clears throat> this, this prophecy is. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Because he saw a valley of, of, of dry bones and they were dead. There was no flesh on them or whatever. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Well, how are those dry bones supposed to hear? They're just dead. There, there's no life in them. How are they going to hear? And you know, this connects us to our memory verse, Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing. But how can you hear if you're spiritually dead? You hear by the Word of God. The Word of God has all the life that we need to, to respond, to hear it, and then trust it, to believe it, to have faith. The same thing here. Ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And I behold, beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. The breath of God gives life. That's abundantly clear here in this passage. Now the other thing is, it talks about a wind. Now we're not going to dive into this, but this is a whole other subject. Showing the connection between the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the Greek words for Holy Spirit is, is pneuma? We think about pneumatic. That has to do with air, wind. The Holy Spirit is identified as a, a wind or air. You see how that closely that is connected to the inspiration God breathed? In fact, it's connected here in this, in this uh, prophecy. Just a few verses of one, verse 14. <clears throat> what, the verses we just read earlier was the breath would give them life. Now look at this. And I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. So previously the breath had been connected to life. Here the spirit is connected to life. So we see they're intertwined. There's a connection. <clears throat> the Spirit of God equals the breath of God equals life. <clears throat> now, a few more verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible 
by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of God is alive. But not only alive, it's alive forever. It's living and abiding forever. John chapter 6, verse 61. Actually, we'll start in verse 51. And we've got a couple passages here we're going to hit. I could read the whole section, but it's kind of lengthy. It says, I am the li this is Jesus speaking to his audience again. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. So you want to live? You've got to eat this bread. And the bread that I give, that I will give, is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, if you took that literally, it sounds pretty disgusting. And that's what, even his, it says many departed from him at this saying. They couldn't take it. Even his own disciples were beginning to have a hard time with this. What does he mean to eat his flesh and drink his blood and that's the only way we can live? That's how we get life? That's how we get eternal life? So Jesus explains himself a few verses later. In verse 63, he says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. Quickeneth means to give life, to impart life. That's the idea of quicken. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Okay, now we can start drawing some conclusions. We can make connections. The Spirit and the Word here are used synonymously. And that's what Jesus meant to give life. When He's referring to His flesh and His blood, He's talking about what He's teaching them. The words that He's speaking. He has the words of life. One of His, his disciples even acknowledged it. Said, he, he said, Master, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. That's what Jesus is emphasizing, emphasizing here. What he is saying gives life. Well, that carries on for us. How do we know what Jesus has said? How do we know, brought it out, what do we, how do we know what God has said? Through the Scriptures. We're not living in a time where there's prophets speaking the words of God. We're not living in a time where there's apostles telling us the word of God. We're not living at a time where Jesus of Nazareth is walking around here on earth giving sermons. The way that we know what God has said is through the Scriptures. And Jesus identifies it as giving life. <clears throat> Believing, but it's not just the words, it's believing the words. Notice, and he finishes that with saying, there'll be some of you that believe not. Now, they're not going to get the life because they're not believing the words. Matthew chapter 4. And this is the temptation in the wilderness where Satan takes Jesus to a, to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and he tempts him with a shortcut path to power. Jesus' response is, but he answered and said, it is written. What does Jesus appeal to as the final authority? It is written. But he doesn't end there. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God breathed. The God breathed words are what we're to live by. The God breathed words give life. They quicken. <clears throat> Jesus tells a parable. It's a, it's a very uh, familiar and, and well-known parable of the sower who went out to sow. And, and Jesus tells about, we're just going to break in here on this one verse, but He went out and He sowed uh, different seeds in different places. Some fell on stony ground, some fell on the, by the wayside, some fell on, um, uh, I can't remember what the other one was, and then uh, one of them was in, in good soil, in a field. Some of those brought forth fruit, others didn't bring forth anything, they were snatched away of the birds before they grew or, or did anything. Now, Jesus is going to explain this parable to His disciples. And He said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. Now that's a good illustration for us. Do you know a seed is dead? By all accounts, a seed is dead. And that seed can be thrown in, in his parable. He said it can be thrown on stony ground and not bring forth anything. It can be thrown on, on the, uh, the path and the birds come and take it away. The, the seed never gave life. <coughs> But when the seed is on good ground, life comes out of it, and it bears fruit. The Word of God. So here's the, here's the lesson. To an unbeliever who, is, who has shut his heart to God, he can read this Bible, he can study it front to back, and it's nothing but a dead book to him. Because he is rejecting the source of life. He could study it for just knowledge, study it for history, he could study it to prove Christianity wrong. There's many reasons why people might read the Word of God, but unless you're reading it with an attitude of faith, believing it, it won't be alive in you. But for those of us who go to it with the right attitude, to believe the Word of God, with the, we go to it with the intent to believe the words written. It brings life. It grows out of what seems to be lifeless words, just like any other book on a shelf. It starts to grow and bear fruit within us. A miracle. Because it's God-breathed. God is breathing that word into you. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, verse 12. <clears throat> For the word of God is quick. There's that word quick again. That means alive. And not only that, but why doesn't the Bible just say the word of God is, is alive? Because that English word, that old, it's an old-fashioned way to use it, but that old-fashioned way of using quick is not only alive, but able to give life. Do you know what Paul, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15? He says, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The second man, Adam, speaking of Christ, a quickening spirit. You know what the difference was? Adam was given life. Christ had life and he was able to impart life. A quickening spirit. The Word of God is quick. It's not just alive. It's able to impart life. So the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <clears throat>
Now, we're right back here to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And your Bibles maybe are, are open there still. But look at this again. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith. Now see how Paul qualifies that. Through faith in Christ Jesus. The, the, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now that's important. He qualifies all that. Now, let's think back. How does that fit with, with the John, I believe it was chapter 5, where we read that Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Now, I've encountered those who have taught from that passage in John that the, the audience of Jesus, the, the Pharisees and whoever was there, were wrong to think that they had eternal life in the Scriptures. And Jesus is confronting them. He says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. I've taught those who say that's wrong. Eternal life is not in a book. It's a person. And it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times the message that comes from that is, this doesn't matter so much. Let's set this aside. Let's not get hung up on doctrine and, and, and divisions. And that's saying, let's just, let's just focus on Christ. Well, how are they going to teach about Christ? Except from here. If they're going to discard this, they're inventing their own Jesus. And Paul warned about those who would preach another Jesus other than the one that he presented. The Jesus that we preach must be rooted in the Scriptures. That's how we know Him. That's how we know a false Jesus. And Jesus was not saying, search the Scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. You're wrong for thinking that. No, He goes on to say, and they are they which testify of Me. In other words, search the Scriptures. Because you unbelievers, you think you have eternal life in the Scriptures, but the Scriptures are testifying of Me, and you're not believing Me, therefore you're not believing the Scriptures. And He goes on a few verses later and He says, you have someone, I am not come to uh, condemn you, you have someone already who condemns you, and that's Moses, whom you proclaim to trust in, but you don't, because had you believed Moses' writings, ye would believe My words, because Moses spoke of Me. Jesus takes them right back to the fact that they think they have eternal life in the Scriptures, but they aren't believing the Scriptures. They think they trust in Moses, but Moses pointed to Christ and they're not drawing the right conclusions of coming to Christ. And they're doing it because they aren't believing the Scriptures. It was all there before them. Oh, they, they, they upheld the Word of God Oh, we're going to, the Pharisees did. And Jesus said, we're going to follow the Word of God. It's, it's the most important thing. And we have eternal life because we obey the Word of God. But they weren't. Jesus is not saying it's the wrong thing to do to uphold the Word of God and to trust in it and to search it and to find eternal life there. That's the right thing to do. But it takes an attitude, the right attitude towards the Word of God. It's not making it fit and change to fit my agenda. It's about me conforming to what it says and going with it. Now, <clears throat> let's read on here in 2 Timothy. So it's uh, make, able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now let's stop there. I pointed out already, it's present tense, isn't it? It's not was given. All Scripture is given. Not was given. And also, it's not inspired men. 
It's not all Scripture is given by inspired men. Now, Peter tells us that the, the, the men who wrote Scripture did so as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They wrote what the Holy Ghost told them to write. Just like in Ezekiel. He wrote that. The, the, the Lord told him things. In Isaiah, you find the prophecies like that full of it, them identifying that they were writing verbatim what God told them. The Holy Ghost told them what to write. <clears throat> but they it was not some, some uh, inspired men. Now, there, there's people that, that they get, have the wrong view of this because they think it was inspired men who wrote the, the Bible. And there's some that even uphold the King James Bible. And, and they will say that the King James translators were inspired as well. I don't believe that to be true. I don't believe Scripture teaches that. It was not inspired men. It's, it's up to men to preserve the Word of God and to translate it accurately. But that's, all the, that's, that's where the responsibility of man ends. Because it's not about special people. It's, a, it's about the words on the page. They are given by inspiration of God. <clears throat> the men wrote what the Holy Ghost told them. The Scripture is God-breathed. The Scripture is inspired. The words are inspired. <clears throat> And so when we intake the Scripture, we're intaking the breath of God, the inspired Word of God. Now, this has some ramifications. Um, we're not worshiping a book. Now, th let's think about that. We're not, we don't worship a book. Because you know what happens when this Bible wears out and the pages start falling out and I can't keep it together anymore? It's okay to throw it in the trash. Sometimes we have a hard time doing that. And that, that's okay too. We should have a, we should have a little, uh, you know, maybe uneasy feeling about that. But it's okay to throw, out a, throw away an, a worn out Bible. Because we don't worship a book. It's the words. But you know what a well-used Bible indicates? It indicates that word is getting in you. That's what matters. That's where the inspiration is. The inspiration was not in the writing. The inspiration is not in, um, in the Greek or the Hebrew or the original manuscripts. The inspiration is when that word gets in you. It's God breathed, and it's a source of life. Now, let's think about that relating to the gospel. Because Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 1, he talked about the word of God which liveth and abideth forever, and that word which is by the gospel preached unto you. Now, Peter might have been talking about a different gospel, but it was still a salvational gospel to the Hebrews. Now, Paul writes this as our gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures." And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel that we believe in order to be saved is rooted in what the Scriptures say. It's not some fuzzy, warm relationship with Christ. And you go out on the street and you tell people, have you ever heard about Jesus? And they say, no. 
Now you say, well, well, Jesus was this great man and he lived a, a martyr's death and you need to have a relationship with him and it'll change your life. There is no salvation there. It's not about some fuzzy, imaginational relationship with Jesus. It's about what the Scriptures say. The Gospel is written according to the Scriptures. Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He rose again the third day and gives life from that according to the Scriptures. And that's how we have eternal life. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we'll go to one more. And I think I think that'll be it. First Thessalonians two thirteen. For this cause also we thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now we just looked at the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, and the gospel saves. It's the gospel of salvation into those that believe. The gospel brings with it eternal life when you believe that message. And that message is according to the scriptures. Here, Paul is teaching the word of God, and no doubt he is using Scripture, but also not all the Scripture has been written yet. And so there's more Scripture that's going to come to these folks in a matter of time. But he's commending them because they received it not just as the word of men, as Paul and, and Silas or whoever was teaching them. They didn't just take it as the word of men. Their attitude was right. They understood this is the word of God. And by believing that, first of all, by believing the gospel as the word of God, they're saved. By believing further instruction and further teaching as the word of God, it works effectually within them. Notice how it says that the word of God, when they believe it as the word of God, it worketh effectually and also you that believe. <clears throat> So the Scriptures speak. The Scriptures are alive. And the Scriptures work in the believer. <clears throat> now, Mark and I do not spend a lot of time teaching from Greek and Hebrew. And it's okay occasionally. In fact, I, I threw one in earlier about the Greek word pneuma for Holy Spirit. It's okay to draw some, some concepts or ideas or a definition or something from that occasionally. But I think largely it is a distraction. And it takes our attitude away from the inspiration of God when we think we have to resort to a different language in order to understand God better. As long as there has been a, a faithful attempt at translation, the inspiration of God is just as relevant in one language as it is another. And, and, and so it comes down to our attitude toward what we hold. The inspiration is not limited to the originals. It's not limited to one language. The inspiration is current. And it's about us believing and receiving it as it is in truth the Word of God. And so when we, when we think just about the translation aspect, maybe there's a question, well, like, well, yeah, but not all the translations say the same thing. Well, that's true. But do you know it's better and I, I definitely think some translations are better than others. That's why Mark and I teach from the King James translation. Because of our belief that it's superior. But do you know, this, and, and maybe this is my opinion, but it would be better 
Because I, there are some errors in some of the other translations, and, and there are, some of them are easy to identify. But it would be better. And I want, I want us to catch what I'm saying here. I grew up in a denomination that only used the King James Bible. And yet they were like the Pharisees and did not believe a large part of it. It would be better to have a different translation, you name it, and believe it to be the authoritative, inspired Word of God than it would be to say, oh, the King James Bible is the only thing that's inspired. It's the only thing you can use and yet disregard what it says or question what it says or manipulate it. You see, our attitude towards the Word of God is more important than identifying the, the ideal or perfect translation. Even though I think it's important to identify the right translation or a good translation. I'm not minimizing that. I'm just saying there are people who use a King James Bible, which I believe is the best, and yet they reject things that it says. Yet they have the wrong attitude towards the Word of God. And they place their own ideas or their church traditions or whatever it is as more authoritative than the Word of God. I'm, I'm convinced that it is better off to have someone else, even if they're using a different translation, to have the right attitude towards the Word of God. If you can take a different translation and you trust in it, at least your attitude is in the right place. Now, let's move on here for just a minute before we close. What a, what, maybe, maybe somebody's thinking, now wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about Scripture giving life. We're talking about Scripture being alive forever, working in us. We're talking about having eternal life in the Scripture. And we're talking about Scripture working effectually in the believer. Isn't that what Christ does? Doesn't Christ give us eternal life? Doesn't Christ work in the believer? Isn't Christ our all in all? Isn't it, even in that passage here in 2 Timothy, shouldn't it be Christ that makes the man of God perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? Well, now wait a minute. Maybe we could go a little different route. Isn't it the Holy Spirit that brings life? Isn't the Holy Spirit that works effectually in us and, and changes us and conforms us to the Holy, to, to, to the image of Christ? Shouldn't it be the Holy Spirit that, that makes the man of God perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works? You see how that we, we, sometimes you think, or, or how do we sort this out? Or are we thinking about this right? All of those are true. Because as Mark and I have been emphasizing, you don't scri separate Scripture from the work of the Holy Ghost. You don't separate Scripture from Christ. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And he's not just talking about the words in red. He also spoke to Paul. He is talking about the Word of God, the Scriptures. And they all, they're, yes, all three. They give life. It's because there is a perfect harmony there. <clears throat> how, do, how do we know? Christ is preeminent. By the way, I said we don't worship a book. We worship Christ. Right? And Christ is preeminent. The Scripture tells us He's preeminent in all things. And it's, it's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow. But how do we know that from the Scripture? 
How do we know about the glory of Christ from the Scripture? How do we know about the the eternal life that Christ offers us based on His work on the cross from the Scripture? How do we know that the Holy Spirit is working in our life? Is it some, some big, big, huge, welling emotion? No. We know the Holy Spirit's working from the Scripture. How do we know the gospel that saves us from the Scripture? So we're not worshiping the book, but the words of Christ are spirit and life, and it brings us to the the truth. If we have the right attitude toward the Scripture, it points us to Christ. It points us to what He has accomplished, and it points us to a glorious future that we have with Him. God has chosen. It's, It's not our choice. God has chosen to reveal the deep things of Himself and the finished work of the cross and the glorious future that awaits us. He has chosen to reveal that through the Holy Scriptures. They're God-breathed. As we believe that, as we inhale that, as we receive it, it gives us life. It works within us. And yes, that's, that's the Holy Ghost working within us. And yes, that is the life of Christ within us. But as we, and, and I think, I can't remember exactly how Don used to say it. But he, he, would, he would talk about sometimes of a more, I remember what, it happened more than one occasion. I, uh, Sunday morning I would say, hi Don, how are you? And he would say, I had a wonderful time with the Lord this morning. And I remember the first couple times I was thinking, that sounds interesting. I mean, I, I didn't know whether he's going to go into his prayer life or what. He said, and, but he said, I had a wonderful time with the Lord this morning. And then he would tell me what he was reading. Because with the right attitude towards Scripture, when you're reading, you are confronting yourself before Christ. You are being confronted with God. And that was a fascinating concept to me. Spending time with the, in the Word with the right attitude is spending time with Christ. And the Holy Spirit causes it to bring fruit in our lives for His glory and for His honor. With that, we'll close. If there's any comment or question, feel free. <clears throat> I, this was really good for me to hear because I always questioned if, if we thought the King James Version was just so great, it's only in English. Like I don't think God would do that. God no. would not leave out a whole host of other people Mm-mm. that couldn't speak English. Mm-mm. So I always wondered, okay, what about the Spanish Bible? What about the Chinese Bible? What about these different languages? How do we comprehend that? That these people have the exact same opportunity is what we do to study a Bible in their own language. So that was good to hear that they have the opportunity that one book isn't above another. I mean, there's better translations. Yes, I would agree to that. If you're going to study it deeply, you want to know exactly what's going on, different words. But it's good to know that there are other translations that will work, other languages. So that, you know, some people aren't left out. Yeah. I agree. Yep. It's, yeah, it's more important. I mean, the gospel, you can take any translation. I think there's some bad English translations overall. But on almost every one of them, the gospel is still there. So if someone goes to it trusting that it is the Word of God and receives the gospel, they can still be saved, even though they're using what I would deem as a bad translation. So the attitude towards the Word of God is so far more important than a specific translation. Yeah, I'll even mention, you know, for most of us, when we got saved, we probably were hearing other people speak the Word. It wasn't that we were necessarily reading it and finding it on our own. So it's not like we picked up 
a King James Bible or a version of a Bible and read it, but it was that somebody probably told us about it and taught it. And so really we were getting a different version that way anyhow it was a paraphrase of mm -hmm. what the bible said and they may have taken it to us and shown us where it said this but it was explained you know probably through you know uh, child ministries or different things you know uh, in in sermons in different ways that it was taught to us so it's not that we only get it through that it's right it's the way that it's explained to us too so but as she was saying i appreciate the way that you show that it is inspired that it is active and that it is happening now that it's not that it was and it was a one-time event right that the bible was put together and that it was inspired of inspired men as many people believe and i've <clears throat> i've seen that you know the way that you you showed that um many churches or will will put that on their website or somewhere that it's only in the manuscripts right and they not even realizing they think they've unfortunately they think they've they've um held this higher regard for it and yet they've actually diminished it thank you right. they've diminished yeah. you know what what the holy scriptures are yeah because they're saying yeah th that it's only there and we can't possess god's word we can't possess the inspired word of god and yet you've shown today yeah. that we all can and yeah. we all do if we believe yeah. what we read and we believe with our whole heart what God has for us. But if we go to it and we always question it and we always doubt it, just as you said, scholars do. Yeah. Um, and to an extent, it's good to ask questions and it's good to, you know, you know, open the word of God and, and bring your questions to the word of God. Right. You can't constantly doubt it and you can't constantly say well i don't know if that actually is what it really means and we if we go to the bible looking to try to you know find the error or we look at it trying to find something that's not quite right then yeah we're going to go at it with the wrong heart attitude and we're not going to we're going to quench the holy spirit in that way yeah. he's not going to be able to be effective in us because we're we're coming at him at a at, at the wrong um mentality of yeah so I appreciate this, yeah. um, you know, understanding, yeah, how Scripture is God-breathed and inspired mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, and thank you. And, and that's one of the reasons, among several, that I will use a King James translation to teach from is because I do have confidence in it. And you hear many uh, Bible teachers or pastors who preach, I'm not saying all, I'm not making a blanket statement, but many who would teach from other translations and they are doubting it and they're always resorting to Greek and Hebrew. To me, that's a problem. If they under, if they don't trust that translation, find a different translation. We shouldn't have to resort to Greek and Hebrew. If you don't trust a specific translation because you identify problems with it, find a better one. But we don't have to resort to some foreign language in order to know the truth of God. But I think that's kind of what you were saying. So, <clears throat> go ahead. I appreciate your efforts today. Some enlightening question. I think that one of the things that really we struggle with is belief. We yeah. Flesh, we sort out our own answers and hard to believe, but we believe in something, whatever we do, everybody believes in something. And the only thing that has a promise, real, real promise, is the scripture. Yeah. But I was listening to a podcast the other day and it really bothered me what I heard. <laughs> there was an educated man on there basically refuting the work of Christ referring to human sacrifice is something that went out years ago. How could human sacrifice be of value? Which means he didn't know the scriptures. Right. It gets very simple. God pronounced righteousness, told us what sin was, told us what the punishment would be. Right. And he supplied it. Yeah. Then we believe it according to the scriptures. Yeah. You, you mentioned right at the beginning the 
the challenge for us is to believe. And I think that's very well said. I, I remember years ago hearing for the first time to me a Bible teacher saying, so many people go to the Word of God and they think they struggle with their understanding. And he said they, they wrestle with how do I understand this? And he said too many times they don't understand it because they haven't dealt with the more important issue is do I believe it? He says, you commit yourself to believing what it says, the understanding will come much easier. He said, too many people rush to an understanding, not committing themselves to believing what it says. And they'll come to a conclusion that maybe contradicts what it says. But the believing part is the challenge. Many times we don't want to believe what it says in the flesh. Is that it? Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time where we can uh, fellowship in Your Word and we can learn of the things of Christ. And Father, we do rejoice in the grace of Christ and we rejoice in His love for us, each one individually, and that He died for each of us, for each one of our sins, so that we could be eternally justified in Your sight. We rejoice in that. Father, we're, we rejoice in the peace that we have with You. And that peace is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we rejoice in His grace and mercy that sustains us throughout life. And we rejoice in the hope that we have of a glorious future in glory with the risen Christ. And so Father, we do pray that uh, we might take these things and, and grow in our faith and our understanding and to be able to, to share and communicate with others who, who are seeking the truth. And Father, we pray that uh, we might have the right attitude towards Scripture. That we might trust in it as it is in truth, the Word of God, and not the Word of men. And so Father, we do pray that You would bless our time together here and help us as we go our separate ways to bring honor and glory to Your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.